Okay, this lecture is the fast and easy way to understand abdominal disease. I could have called it Western abdomen or Western abdominal diseases. So real quick, here's the, <clears throat> I'm going to go into CAT scans. I'm going to go into anatomy. I'm going to go to theories of disease. I think this will be real useful to you. I know a lot of doctors who did fellowships in body imaging, you know, abdominal disease. And I also know a lot of gastroenterologists. A lot of them are very smart, top 10% of their class, AOA, all that stuff and none of them know any of this stuff, okay? The gastroenterologist might know a little bit, but even them, they don't know it, okay? Everybody thinks gastroenterologists. Gastroenterologists know how to look up your butt with a tube, but they really don't necessarily know the philosophy of disease. And, and the reasons why you wanna understand theories of disease is, once you understand the theory of disease, it explains what causes the disease, and then you, can, you know what to do to prevent the disease, okay? Doctors are not taught the causes of disease, and that's the most important thing to know. So anyways, real quick epidemiology, the Pima, we're in northern Mexico, and so are the Tarahumara. Tarahumara, means, and that means fleet runner, by the way. In the Mexican-American War, 1848, these two populations that used to be together got separated. Tarahumara stayed in northern Mexico, Copper Canyon area, Sierra Madre Mountains. They can run 100 miles in two days. Every guy in town, not just the fast guy. They eat mostly corn, and they also eat uh, some beans, and they eat local greens. They eat a tiny bit of meat, like less than 5% of their diet. Okay, lots of American ultramarathoners have gone on to study them. You can look it up in two seconds, Tarahumara. They're famous ultramarathon runners. Okay, the Pima populations that used to be combined with Tarahumara pulled into Arizona. They eat the standard American diet now after the Mexican-American War, 1848. And they're f sort of famous for being fat and sick, okay? And they get all the Western diseases, appendicitis, uh, diverticulitis, get sigmoid colon resected, uh, diabetes, plugging up their arteries in their legs, peripheral vascular disease, and they get leg amputations, uh, lots of gallstones, and they get uh, gallbladder surgeries are real sort of famous for having a high incidence of that, and all the other Western diseases, open heart surgery, cabbages, coronary artery bypass graft. But anyway, so the epidemiology confirms what I'm saying. Now let's move on to a little bit of anatomy. Here is a woman, and here is her uterus. Here's the vagina, here's the cervix, here's the uterus. Uh, the body of the uterus, the fundus of the uterus, and she has a pedunculated fibroid projecting off the fundus of her uterus. Here is a urinary bladder. This is an MRI. It's a sagittal image. And you can see this big fibroid. Fibroids are caused to grow by estrogen, okay? So estrogenic effects will increase fibroids. Big honking fibroid right there. And because it's away from the endometrial cavity, it's not necessarily going to inter interfere with their menstrual cycle, but a lot of times they'll have multiple fibroids within their uterine lining as well. I know tons of women having to get uh, hysterectomies in their 20s and 30s because of these fibroids. Okay. Um, now here, by the way, is an interesting picture. This is a man. Okay. You can see he's got a Johnson here, and this is his prostate. Now this is more enlarged than usual, but I routinely see big honking prostates that at first glance they look almost like a uterus, and that's because the male prostate is the hormone analog of the female uterus, and it gets enlarged by estrogenic chemicals. People in Western societies in the modern world are exposed to tons and tons of estrogen chemicals. That is a big part of why modern uh, American and other Western societies are so feminized. Okay, They're incredibly feminized compared to how they used to be. You guys, everybody takes it for granted, all these men wearing around you know, earrings and bracelets and all this other crap. They weren't doing that when I was young. It was a rare thing when I was young. Now that's considered normal. <laughs> okay. Anyways, um, so this is a giant uh, prostate enlarged by estrogenic chemicals. And, of course, this guy's going to have some trouble urinating. So a little worse than however much we shake and dance a couple drops ends up in our pants. Okay, now here is Dennis Burkett's uh, abdominal pressure syndrome. So Dennis Burkett was the Irish doctor, Christian missionary surgeon, went to Africa. He figured out a pattern of... Uh, causation for something called Burkitt's lymphoma, and because of that, he did such a great job with that, he was put in charge of the epidemiology of the entire continent, and he saw the patterns of disease. Basically, the people who came from England, and they're still eating bread and jam with tea and no fiber, <laughs> they got all these diseases of the abdomen, okay? And then the persons eating the plant-based diet, like the local persons, they didn't get any of these diseases, okay? So why does this happen? What does fiber do to the stool? It attracts water to the stool. It adds bulk water to the stool. So when a person defecates, it's like a cow patty instead of like a Tootsie Roll. If a person's popping out Tootsie Rolls, they have to generate more abdominal pressure to help push out the hard stool. And straining at the stool is called the Valsalva maneuver during defecation. Well, the Valsalva maneuver pushes back pressure into the abdomen. The back pressure pushes the esophagus up into the chest, and that's called the hiatal hernia. And that causes gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD. 
and then when the acid is refluxing into that abnormally displaced hiatal hernia, it'll irritate the lining of it, and it becomes first a Barrett's esophagus. This is the name for the, you know, the mucosal uh, changes, metaplasia, we'll call it, and that will sometimes lead to esophageal cancer. Esophageal cancer, when I was a young guy in med school, was smoker drinker cancer, squamous cell carcinoma. Now it is primarily adenocarcinoma, um, and that's because of gastroesophageal reflux from all these fat people with abdominal pressure syndrome. Okay, the next thing is because the stool is dried out, on the right side of the, of the colon, you should normally have liquefied stool here. When it is dried out, you can form a pentacle list, little rocks of stool, stool balls. Fecal lists are also called, and they will obstruct the appendix, and then the mucus glands from below will keep secreting their mucus, and they can't get out because they're trapped by the stool ball obstructing the appendix, and it'll pop. That's appendicitis. Much, much, much more common in persons who eat processed food and meat rather than plant foods. Okay, also straining at the stool during defecation, the back pressure comes up into the sigmoid colon and it causes little outpouchings of the wall called diverticulosis. When one of those pops, and I'll show you a CAT scan in just a moment, one of those pops, you get diverticulitis from the back pressure. The back pressure also is transmitted down into the leg veins and by transmitting down in the leg veins, they get varicose veins like this over here. So women, good to know that. You know, you don't want varicose veins, don't be constipated. Okay, you get back pressure down onto the veins that go into the scrotum called the varicocele. So these heat up the testicle can cause infertility. So being constipated can make a man infertile. They'll also cause back pressure downward into the veins of the rectum and you get rectal hemorrhoids. That can cause bleeding in the stool. Um, inguinal hernias, you know, herniations of bowel down into the inguinal region, the groin area. Um, you can also get periumbilical hernias of the anterior abdominal wall. So anyways, this is abdominal pressure syndrome, and this was described by Dennis Burkett back in the 1960s. <clears throat> and the smart thing is just eat your fiber. It's the most common cause of uh, nutrient deficiency in Americans. And, uh, you know, Burkett felt we were supposed to be eating over 100 grams a day. The average Americans eating like around 12. Okay, here's a CAT scan with a uh, patient who has diverticulosis. You can see these little air bubbles are little outpouchings of the bowel wall. And here one of them is perforated. Normal mesenteric fat is relatively clean. Um, you know, like up in here, you can see how f this fat is very dirty. That's inflammatory stranding due to spillage of the stool into the surrounding um, mesenteric fat. And right now it's just inflamed. We call that a phlegmon, inflamed fat. But sometimes it'll become more coalescent and you'll have an abscess, a fluid containing abscess that might need surgical drainage because the antibiotics can't get to the center of it. So that is diverticulitis, a perfor perforation of diverticulosis due to abdominal pressure syndrome. Okay, now I'm briefly going to tell you a little bit about uh, ischemic spinal degeneration. And I'm, I'm the person who made, there, there were papers written about this like back in the 1980s about some association between atherosclerosis of the abdominal aorta and degenerative disc disease of the spine. But I'm the person who figured out it's not just degenerative disc disease of the spine. It's all the degeneration of the spine, including DISH, including OPLL, including OLF. And I'll show you pictures of that in a moment. So here is the abdominal aorta. It gives off a little twig mid-height of the vertebral body, and then another twig goes upward to the upper end plate, downward to the lower end plate, and the disc itself is alive. The disc runs on anaerobic glycolysis. Okay, I'll show you some better pictures of that here. i got better pictures than this. That's just the cover of my book that I wrote about it. I've written two books on spine. Okay, so here's the aorta. Here is the lumbar artery, mid-height of the vertebral body, a little twig to the upper end plate of the vertebra, lower end plate of the vertebra, and by diffusion, glucose will diffuse into the disc and the disc will also extrude its waste products back into this area and they can be removed by the venous system okay and by the lymphatics all right so the point is when you get atherosclerosis it tends to occur along the posterior wall of the abdominal aorta which narrows called stenosis um, or occludes this lumbar artery then you don't get enough blood back here to the spine the outer layer of the disc is like a steel belted radial tire and it will fail it'll crack and it's called the annulus fibrosis when it cracks the center is like a jelly donut. It's called the nucleus pulposus. When it cracks, the jelly donut part will start to leak out in areas. Okay, so here's the nucleus pulposus in the center. That's like the jelly donut. Here's the annulus fibrosus on the outer surface like a steel belted radial tire. So when the annulus fibrosus cracks due to lack of blood supply, ischemia, the disc can herniate into it. Okay, a thoroughly degenerated disc is all dried out, desiccated, and it'll have a loss of height. 
okay? This is what I meant by upper end plate up here, lower end plate. Those initially are a different type of bone. They're cartilaginous bone, and that enables the spine to grow during childhood. Then eventually they all ossify. They're no longer growing. Okay, here's just a quick look. Here's a disc protrusion. Stays at the same height as the disc, you know, relative to the vertebral bodies. An extrusion goes up or down relative to the original disc height. A schmorl's node, very common, is a herniation of the disc into the adjacent vertebral body. Okay, the fat in the back here, the space around the spinal elements with the cerebral spinal fluid is called the epidural space. And I see a lot of people accumulate fat in there. Accumulation of fat in that space is called epidural lipomatosis. So lipoma means fatty. Okay, here is DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, DISH, and it's really just a name for having bridging osteophytes. When the disc fails due to ischemia, there's some other reasons why a disc can fail, but primarily it's ischemia, you'll form these bridging osteophytes, and what they're doing is the spine has proprioceptors to sense abnormal motion between the two vertebrae because the disc has failed, and it tries to fuse that segment by forming a bridging osteophyte. This grows down from the VB above, this grows up from the VB below, and then they fuse. All right, and again, that's called DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. And the old books from the 1990s would say, oh, this is a rare thing seen more commonly in Asians. That's a bunch of nonsense. I see this all day long, every single day. And I'll start seeing it in the back here, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. We'll often call it disc osteophyte complex. I'll often see the disc itself, after it dries out, it'll calcify, and you'll fuse the vertebrae between each other. That's called an interbody fusion. So anyways... We see these on all the abdomen, abdomen CAT scans. That's why I'm calling this abdomen disease, because if you read an abdominal CAT scan, you'll see this constantly. Okay, so here's what it looks like. Um, this is my drawing of how it, it advances all the way from the sacrum, the pelvis, all the way up through the lumbar spine, thoracic spine, and goes up to the cervical spine, all the way to the skull. Okay, and it can occur in the back. That's what I meant by OPLL, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. The posterior longitudinal ligament runs along the posterior surface of the vertebral bodies, and it will ossify in this context. The spine is trying to fuse itself, just like the Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. The hedgehog has only one trick, but it's the best trick in the sense that the hedgehog can play dead, let's say. Okay, but what I'm saying is what the spine can do, the one trick of the spine is it can lay down calcium at sites of abnormal motion to fuse those segments. But once it fuses one segment, then there's going to be increased pressure on the vertebrae above and below, and they will fail. And the accelerated uh, disc degeneration at adjacent levels to the fusion segments will just progress all the way up and down to the top of the spine. So the person ends with a stiff spine, and it's real brittle. They stop exercising. The muscles atrophy, then they fall down. They get these terrible fractures called chalk stick fractures, okay? So anyways, I'm, I'm just telling you, all of this stuff is related to ischemia primarily. You can also get it from glyphosate, substituting into collagen and damaging the collagen. All these ligaments are made primarily out of collagen, and the spine can start to fail for that reason. F- minus can also do it by also damaging collagen. A lack of uh, vitamin C can contribute to it because you need vitamin C to hydroxylate your prolines and make your collagen as well. Collagen is about one-third of all the protein in the body and it's essential for these ligaments that help hold the spine into position. These little uh, <coughs> orange spots on the abdominal aorta are for calcification and again showing when this gets all calcified due to atherosclerosis it'll narrow. The medical word for narrowing is stenosis. It'll stenose all the lumbars and even occlude a lot of them and that makes the spine ischemic. Ischemia means lack of blood supply. And here's like gaseous disc degeneration. Here's bridging osteophytes of this VB. Here's the bridging osteophyte of the VB vertebra above it and they're growing towards each other. Eventually they'll fuse. These are just about fused right here. Again, gaseous disc degeneration, gaseous disc degeneration, gaseous disc degeneration, gaseous disc degeneration. I often see it at every single level. And here you can see that the disc has so severely failed, failed it's almost disappeared, okay? This is severe disc space narrowing, okay? So as you can imagine, when that disc is not able to do its job, the VBs have to bear more weight. So one thing that they form the osteophytes for is to increase their weight-bearing surface. And here you can see ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament with ossification of that ligament along the posterior disc space surface, okay? Okay, now I'm briefly going to talk a little bit about estrogen. Uh, so the estrogen is a fat storage hormone, and men get tons of estrogen from their diet, from tap water, from their processed foods. Um, being fat itself will create a vicious cycle where the fat has more aromatase enzyme. It'll be converting testosterone into estrogen. And a lot of these guys, they call it a beer belly. To me, it's like a pregnant female belly, an estrogen belly. And they also got moobs for man boobs, okay? And it's really gynecomastia, meaning there's some female breast uh, tissue under there, too. It's not a good thing. 
And there's an, you know, tons of guys are becoming infertile with all these high estrogenic chemicals. All right, so here you have a uh, cholesterol backbone. You have these four cyclic rings called the ABCD rings. And the A ring in estrogen has um, uh, aromatic, is three double bonds on there, like a benzene ring. And these will resonate. And they're very high stability. Um, you'll have a hydroxyl group on there. This combination of an aromatic ring and a hydroxyl group is called a phenol, and it's a great preservative. It prevents fungi, mold, from growing. So the corporations put tons of estrogen-like preservatives in their products with processed food and also personal care products so it doesn't spoil on the shelf. Uh, estrogen, the way it interacts with the receptor is it forms a hydrogen bond <clears throat> through this, um, the phenol component. <clears throat> and that's why anything that's got this phenol component on it, this aromatic benzene ring and a hydroxyl group there, will interact with the estrogen receptor. And there's a lot of compounds that have that. And there's always going to be, because it's so profitable to make these, corporations will always make them. You can never ban them because they're just too easy to make for the corporations. Okay, here's a classic example. This is, uh, you know, BPA, bisphenol A. So bis means two in chemical language. That means two. And a phenol is what we talk about, this benzene ring with hydroxyl group on it. So bisphenol, there's two phenol groups. And then you just throw a little something, a couple carbons in the middle. So people say, oh, we want bisphenol A banned. Okay, fine. The company says, we'll ban it. They just put something else. Here you got a sulfate in the middle. All right, so what that means is bisphenol S. It still activates the estrogen receptor. And there's a whole bunch of other versions of this, so it's never going to go away. Corporations make billions of dollars off these chemicals. Now, when people want to lower their estrogen levels, what happens is their body excretes these chemicals, and what they do is they, um, I'm trying to shrink myself here. I shrank the kids, I shrank the old man. All right. So normally estrogen goes to the liver to be excreted, and it gets um, hydroxylated, it gets glucuronidated. Glucuronidated, think of it as just being like a glucose with a carboxylic acid on it, and then it's excreted in the bile, makes it more water-soluble. Bile is more water-like so more water -like than you think, even though, of course, it contains fats and cholesterol. All right, so anyways, it's excreted in the bile, which goes into the intestinal tract. Now, normally, we would just defecate that out, and by defecating it out of our bodies, we'd lower our bodily estrogen levels. However, when you eat processed food and meat, you get, there's two types of gut flora. Don't get confused by all this microbiome hype. There's two main types. And the type that comes from eating plant foods with the fiber is the good type. The bad type comes from eating meat and processed food. It has a lot more of this enzyme in it, those bacteria, glucuronidase. Glucuronidase. And that enzyme will cleave off this conjugation here. And once this is cleaved off, now the estrogen is reabsorbed through the intestinal tract into the blood. So estrogen levels come way up. So the typical American, you know, unfortunate, ignorant person, they're drinking tap water that's got tons of estrogen in it because it's too expensive for municipal water filtration to remove those estrogens, number one. Number two, they eat meat, which tends to have lots of estrogen. It helps the animal, the cattle, to get fat real fast. Okay, they also use personal care products, deodorant, etc. So they're slathering estrogen on themselves, and it's transdermally absorbed. In chemistry, like this, I was like, your skin is mostly lipid, Okay, and it'll absorb the lipids you put on the skin. It's made to keep water out. That's why you can swim in the water and not instantly become waterlogged. Okay, and I talked about a vicious cycle. The fatter you get, you just keep getting fatter because the fat cells themselves make aromatase, convert your, your testosterone into estrogen, and that makes you get fatter. <clears throat> and it creates this whole vicious cycle of getting fatter and fatter. And you'll notice most people, once they're fat, they never lose the weight. And they could easily do it. You know, here is the Spartan vegan. You know, I named the Spartan vegan after my own background as a wrestler, kind of Spartan. And it's really simple. Anybody could do this diet. The only thing you need to know for cooking is just <clears throat> how to boil potatoes, sweet potatoes, rice beans, oatmeal, quinoa. All these starches, you just boil them. Talk about easy. Fruits are good as well. Veggies are good. You'll just need to take B12 if you're 100% vegan. Exercise, maintain your relationships, all that stuff. Okay, so that's the Spartan vegan diet. Just a little bit more on estrogens, and I'll go into another thing real quick, too, and that'll be a summary of a disease. So the reason I'm saying the radiologists don't know this, and these are top of their class radiologists, you know, and I'm friends with them. I know them real well. They just know what's in the radiology books, and the radiology books say this is this disease, this is this disease, this is this disease. They never put it all together. What I've done for you is just put it all together. When you look at an abdomen CAT scan, abdomen and pelvis CAT scan, the reason the uterus is big, the reason the prostate is big is because of estrogen effects. The reason they're fat, partly because of estrogen effects, partly because of the high-fat diet. The reason they're atherogenic, the abdominal aorta messing up the spine, is because of the high-fat diet, okay, and also the high-sodium diet, but especially the high-fat component of the diet. And the reason why they're constipated and they got a hiatal hernia, GERD, and they got all the hernias, 
abdominal pressure syndrome, diverticulosis, diverticulitis, is because of the lack of dietary fiber. Here's a power benzoic acid, another estrogen-like uh, chemical. You can see the phenol component here, the hydroxyl group, the benzene ring, and there'll be a ben there'll be like a benzoic acid on the power position. That means directly opposite the phenol. And so that's power benz, power benzoic acid, typical preservative in deodorants and other personal care products. Okay. This is just, I, I was joking, like, you know, the periodic table of the elements. <clears throat> I made a periodic table of the estrogenics, estrogenic chemicals. As you can see, these are very common chemicals, and there's tons of them, all right? Tons of them. They're all over the place. The only way you can avoid these things is to become a minimalist. That's why I recommend live like Adam and Eve, but keep your indoor heating and plumbing. Stay away from all these chemicals, man. They're not good for you. One last thing I'll show you here. Here's an example of ulcerative colitis, and I could just as easily have shown you Crohn's disease, and basically, when you got leaky gut, you get inflammation of the bowel wall. What causes leaky gut? A high-fat, processed food, meat diet, as well as vegetable oils, as well as alcohol, antibiotics will all contribute to this. Chlorinated water, F- minus water. That's why you want at least a carbon filter to get the chlorine out of there. You'll need reverse osmosis. Uh, or maybe, I think, there's a few other ways you can get out with distillation. Some of the new versions, ion exchange, may be removed. I'm not positive about that. But anyways, this is basically... Um, all this works. Okay, so that's the end. Um, I, I hope that was helpful to you, the idea that you can look at an abdominal CT and say, this is a manifestation of estrogen overload. This is a manifestation of excessive dietary fat as well as excessive animal protein that's also atherogenic. And this is a manifestation of a lack of fiber. And once you see one, you can make sure you look for the other things that are related to that. And I think this can be helpful. I know this is helpful to radiologists for interpreting abdominal disease. This is helpful for physicians making sense of abdominal disease. And this is helpful for anybody who wants to understand abdominal disease. So uh, I know no doctors don't know these patterns. That's why I shared them with you. I hope it was interesting. I learned all this stuff from reading on my own and studying on my own. So anyways, I hope that was helpful and interesting.